What do you do on a daily basis? Um, well, I suppose that depends what day it is. When I work here, I come in to the office and either I look at things down a microscope, so I look at ants, or I um, write about science, or I do maths, data analysis. But then for half the year, I'm also abroad in Indonesia, which is where I do my field work. Um, so when I'm out there, I go out into the field, very sweaty, have a lot of digging, do some digging, look at insects and things. Yeah. Why did you choose your, this job? Um, I suppose I should be prepared for these questions <laughs> if I knew this interview was coming in. <laughs> Why did I choose this job? Um, I think what I really like about this job is the diversity um, of things that I get to do. So I'm not sitting at a desk all the time, I get to do lots of different kinds of things. And I also like that I have the autonomy to be creative, so I'm kind of managing my own project and I can do what I want to do, which is, well, I mean, with the permission of my supervisor. Obviously, so. <laughs> How many female scientists do you usually see in a day? Um, in my research group, we have a lot of female scientists, so we're probably half and half, I would say, in my research group. Um, yeah, I think in the department we have roughly half and half as well, overall, so quite a lot. What got you so interested in arts and dance? Um, I just think that's are great. Ants are fantastic. I think what really got me interested in ants was their social behaviour. So um, they cooperate in massive groups and do incredible things which they couldn't do independently and that's why they're so successful. I think that's really cool. Um, just quickly. I'm working in oil palm plantations because that's where my supervisor works and uh, he's great, so I wanted to work with him. But also oil palm plantations are really interesting because they're expanding rapidly in Southeast Asia and causing a lot of deforestation, which is bad for biodiversity, so it's important to learn about how they can manage the more Thank you. What do you do on a daily basis? Uh, so on a daily basis, um, I'm involved in a project where we're mapping the brain of a fruit fly. So the brain of a fly was scanned with really high resolution microscope. This is on the computer. And then we go through all the uh, images of that fly brain and reconstruct all the cells in this brain. So I'm on the computer. Um, reconstructing these cells. So. What was the hardest part about your job? Um, the hardest part? I don't really know if there is a hard part. Um, it was quite, quite good fun. Um, I guess in research there's quite a lot of demand to publish your results. Um, so I think that's probably the main challenge. And how many female scientists you usually talk to in a day? Uh, so in my group, it's probably about 50, 50 um, women and men, so yeah, quite a lot. Hello, um, and today we're going to be interviewing Rosie. Could you please introduce yourself to everyone? I'm Rosie Trevelyan, and uh, I spend most of my time in tropical forests. Okay, so the first question I'm going to ask you is, what inspired you to become a scientist? Or who inspired you, basically? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I loved natural history from an early age, so as a child I would always be looking at things in hedgerows, caterpillars, butterflies. I was also interested in birds, so um, when I heard that you could study biology, I just thought that's, that's what I want to do. I'm going to do that as my life's ambition. Yeah.
And I guess, uh, I know everyone says this, but um, I was massively inspired by David Attenborough. Um, he produced a, ma a wonderful book on uh, called Life on Earth, and I just remember reading every single page of it and thinking, that's what I want to study. Okay. Next. Next. Um, so, what sort of things do you do on a daily basis? Oh, well, I have... I guess I have two completely different kinds of days, so I'll start with the most exciting ones. So um, one of the things I do is I run courses for people who want to be uh, conservationists and tropical ecologists. And so instead of running the course in the classroom, we go out into the tropics, into a tropical forest. So my, my day there would be getting up really early, listening to some of the wonderful birds singing, and then we'll go out and do some field exercises and practicals and learn about the tropical forest. So that's my exciting day. The other kind of day I have is um, I'm running a charity and we raise the money to do all of this. So I'm scratching my head thinking, where can I get funding from in order to uh, run these courses? Because we're training people from the tropics to, uh, to, to do tropical work. Which forest do you go to? So, uh, we go to forests in Africa. So there's a wonderful forest in Africa called Kibali Forest. And it has chimpanzees, it has monkeys, it has amazing ants. Um, and another forest we go to is in Borneo, uh, where, where we actually are lucky enough to see orangutans and amazing ants in there as well. Okay. Um, so, what would you say to aspiring scientists? Uh, I would say um, it's fantastic if you have that interest because I think it's a kind of job you do that you're doing because you're really interested in it and uh, you're really passionate about it. So if people are interested, follow, you know, follow, follow, follow your ideas and there's still a lot of new things to discover out there. Um, so I think that's, that's really exciting. So I think, yeah, follow your ideas, follow your passion, follow your ideas and, um, and go for it. And the great thing is there really are jobs out there where you can be a scientist, whether it's um, in a lab, whether it's in a university or the kind of science I do, which is actually um, with um, a, a charity um, and spending my time in the forest. Hello, um, what would you like to introduce yourself to everybody? Hi, I'm Annie Bladen and I'm doing a PhD in the Department of Zoology here. So the first question I'm going to ask you is, why did you choose to become a scientist? So my route into science was actually a little bit circuitous. Um, so my first degree was in classics um, quite a few years ago, which is very different to what I do now. Um, but I was always really interested in natural history and going outside and looking at wildlife and trying to work out why animals do what they do. Um, but I'd always seen that as a hobby. Um, but then I worked for a couple of years as a tax advisor after I um, graduated. And during that time, I realized that it was something that I was really passionate about. So um, I took another course, which was a graduate diploma in ecology. Um, and then I started my master's here, and then I started my PhD. So really, it's been a passion for quite a while, but only a job for the last few years. Great, next question. <laughs> Do you enjoy doing what you do? Oh, so good. Do you enjoy doing what you do? I love it. It's um, it's brilliant. I get a lot of freedom to explore things that really interest me, um, and it keeps me busy all the time, which for me works great. So I can never get bored. Okay. <laughs> Next question. Um, what do you like to do after your education? Um, so at the moment, I'm quite interested in either staying in academia. So continuing to do the research that I do now, or maybe something a little bit different. Um, or potentially moving into science communication. So something I'm really passionate about is telling um, particularly young people, but everyone, about science and making it sound like a viable career option for lots of different people. Thank you. What do you do on a daily basis? So my PhD work day to day is working on computers. So I use a software program called R to build models that look at where birds go and then the different environmental conditions in those places, trying to work out why they're choosing to look for food in the places that they go. What is the hardest part about your job? <laughs> uh, that's probably the hardest part. Um, getting, getting the code that you have never written before or looking at environmental variables that you haven't looked at before is always difficult the first time you do it. Um, but the nice thing about working in a computational structure is that once you work something out, you can modify the code you've already written 
to, to do something different but similar the next time. So it's always hard the first time, but I think then that becomes a benefit later on. What is your motivation? <laughs> this is the hard question. Um, I think my motivation on a, on a kind of broad scale level is because I think doing science is important and I think asking questions is, is fundamentally kind of the way that we're going to understand the world better and that comes from kind of an ethical position of I think that we have a bit of a duty to protect the world we live in and protect the non-humans in it uh, and if we can understand more about their ecology then we can do that better. Hi, I'm Pradna Bindra. I'm from India. I'm a wildlife conservationist and a writer. Would you do a name? Well, I come from a country which has a wide diversity of wildlife. It's one of the mega biodiversity countries, so I work to protect tigers and elephants and dolphins and coral reefs and all the other amazing wildlife that we have. I work on policy and on an everyday basis, I could either be negotiating with governments to protect tigers, or I could be in the field uh, trying to see where there are elephants, trying to The most interesting part of my job is the fact that of being in the field, of having that absolute joy of being in nature, watching animals, um, and also um, the unexpected stuff that is there. One day I could be uh, in near the sea, one day I could be uh, where uh, on a river where there are crocodiles, the next day I could be watching a tiger, and also meeting different people who are working to protect them. That's interesting. The hardest part is the saving them because we are in the age of sixth extinction, there are lots of pressures on wildlife, they are being traded, uh, they are in the illegal wildlife trade, killed uh, for their meat or the traditional medicines, and their also habitat is under pressure. So actually convincing people why nature matters to us, why we must save wildlife, is, is the tough part of my job, but at the same time it's, an, it's a challenge I, I relish. What barriers have you come across in your career and what barriers have you been to um, so, um, so there is, it's an unconventional field to be in. And um, convincing my family that uh, where there we are a traditional set of expectations uh, because you're a woman or because you come from a conservative family was, was a challenge. Uh, let's just say, but once they saw that, you know, what I'm doing and how I'm making a contribution, they have a sense of pride in me. So that's one level of difficulty. Also at times when you're negotiating, as a woman, when you're negotiating with governments, with senior people, uh, uh, you have to sometimes prove, it's work a little harder to prove yourself. But what I would say to be, uh, younger generation is, you know, you need fire in your belly to be, you need a sense of conviction, you need to be able to have that passion so you can ignite that passion, inspire others. And you need to be very, very determined. It's not an easy field to be in. Um, as I said, it's tough times for wildlife, but it's also a very interesting, exciting field to be in. So, Go out there, uh, learn, be with nature, read, and you know it's your future, it, and it's it's the world that you you live in that you inherit, and it's the rent that you pay for being here. And trust me, you know being out there in nature, you you'll enjoy it. So just enjoy your job as well. How old were you when you decided? To you wanted to be a zoologist, why? So I studied all four science subjects at A-level. So I did biology, chemistry, physics and maths. It's because I've always been interested in how the world works and why. Um, but I really didn't know which science I preferred. And it was only when I came to university. So I first actually applied for physics rather than biology. 
and I, it was just through picking modules at university, just picking the ones that I was most interested in, that I fell into doing what I'm doing now. What obstacles have you had to overcome to become a zoologist? So I think I've had a very lucky route to where I am now. Um, so I went to an all-girls senior school, and I'm now at a college here at Cambridge that's all women. Um, so it's been very important for me because I've always been surrounded by female role models, so I've always had an image of somebody who looked like me in all sorts of positions. Um, but I'm very aware that I feel like I've circumvented barriers that other people have to overcome. So I think I've been very lucky, but it's made me aware of how important the female role models are. What advice would you give to uncommon female scientists? I would say always follow what you're interested in. Don't think too much about the end point because your ideas and your views and your plans always change. So it's always best to just make sure whatever decision you're making at that time is one that you're happy with and you're interested in. And I would say always make the effort to find that female role model who looks like you, who you can identify with, doing something that you admire. Hi, my name is Maddie and I'm a second year PhD student in the Department of Sport. Um, who was your inspiration? Um, I would say that the other students in my groups as I've gone through my studies uh, have really inspired me and working with people who love what you do is uh, really, really great. Uh, would you say you were pushed to carry on your work? Um, no, I've actually gone out of studying, um, worked for a bit and then come back to do my PhD. I think this is a uh, great because uh, it's something that I really wanted to do and decided to do by myself. What qualifications do you have? So I did my Bachelor of Science at St Andrews in Scotland and a Master's degree in Saudi Arabia and this is my second year of PhD. Have you always wanted to work in science? If not, then what did you want to do? That's a good question. Um, I didn't know I wanted to work with science, I kind of just kept going, um, kept doing what I enjoyed and ended up staying in science. What made you so interested in marine biology? Um, I think watching documentaries uh, it was really amazing to me, it seemed like another world, so I was just really inspired to learn more about it. Why did you pick the fish of the Red Sea reefs to work on? Uh, I think the Red Sea is an incredible place. Um, it's really different to many other parts of the world. It's really, really hot there the, in the water, so the adaptations that the animals have there are really special. Thank you. Uh, what was your inspiration? What was my inspiration? What was my inspiration? So, my mum is actually a scientist, and my stepfather was also a scientist, so growing up, I had science conversations at dinner. Um, but my parents are in a really different fields, and I grew up running around outside, and that's why I'm a biologist, because honestly, I love everything that's outdoors. And so my parents made sure to sort of bring me to different places and introduce me to different people. So for me, science started at a very, very, very young age. I've wanted to be a biologist since I was two years old. Uh, you were encouraged. Yes, I was encouraged a lot. What, what qualifications do you have? So I've got a bachelor's degree, that's an undergraduate degree in science, and then I've got a PhD as well. So many people have a master's degree, I don't because of the, how the degree program works in the US, which is where I'm from. But right now I've got the six years of my PhD done and four years of undergraduate work. What made you so interested in butterflies and their mating courtship? So I'm what we call a chemical ecologist, which is to say someone who studies how organisms interact using chemistry. And basically butterflies do this and it's a new idea. We think about moths as doing it, but butterflies doing it is less common. And so the group was looking for somebody with my skills, and I was really interested in trying to look at these things in a new organism, rather than in plants, which is what I used to study. Uh, why did you come to the UK? I came to the UK because there was a group working on this question, and they actually wanted someone to work on it. So I didn't come to the UK going like, oh, I want to live in the UK, but oh, there's this really cool group of people, and I really want to work on this thing. So. Have you always wanted to work in science? If not, then what did you want to do? Um, when I was very, very young, I thought I might want to be a veterinarian, but I was afraid of blood. Like, I would pass out if I saw blood, and so then I thought I'll be a zoologist, and then I decided to be a biologist in general. Where did you study? 
where did I study? I studied at MIT in the US, which is a four-year university, mostly engineering, but also science. And then my PhD was at a state university in Washington State in uh, Seattle. Thank you. Yep. Should you introduce yourself first? Sure. So I'm Eva Hingerbotham. I'm a fourth-year PhD student at the Department of Zoology, and I study brain development in fruit flies. And my name is Bob Boyd. I'm going to be interviewing her for the first question of and the first question is, why did you choose to become a scientist? That's a really good question. Um, I actually originally wanted to be a writer. I loved reading and writing when I was a young teenager. And then for my GCSEs, I had a really amazing biology teacher. Her name was Dr. Matthews. And I just remember her teaching us about osmosis. She just said, isn't that so cool? Like, isn't it amazing that it works? And from then I started thinking, oh yeah, I really like this. I really like biology. So that was sort of the first spark. So for the research that I do now, I'm a developmental biologist, which means I want to know how you go from a fertilized egg, an embryo, to a baby. How do you grow arms and legs and a head in the right place, etc. etc. So the reason I was inspired to study that is during my undergraduate degree, um, I started getting introduced to developmental biology, and there was a professor there who was talking about it and he said, you know, to understand development, you need to understand genetics, you need to understand cell biology, physiology, a little bit of anatomy. And for me, I really liked the idea that you need to have all these different parts working together to understand something properly. So to follow my, the reason I followed my focus is that it included all my favorite bits of other types of biology. Um, how do you try to understand cell biology? It's a great question. So I study this in the fruit farm. So fruit flies, they're the little tiny flies you see in the kitchen in the summer. Um, and we know a lot about them, the scientists have been studying them for a long time. So their real name is Drosophila melanogaster. And what I do is I look at Drosophila embryos, and then I look at their larva, which is the stage after they hatch out the embryo, and I look at their brain and their ventral nerve cord. So their ventral nerve cord is the equivalent to our spinal cord, they don't have a spine, so we can't call it. And I try and understand how the different cells that make up the brain and the ventral nerve cord know what kind of cell they're supposed to be. So to do that, I do lots of dissections. So I dissect the larva to take out the brain and ventral nerve cord. And then I stain it with different chemicals that allow me to look at the different cells in different ways. And then I use a very expensive microscope that I try not to breathe in order to actually analyze the nerve cord. It's very fiddly. You're right. So I actually do all my dissections using uh, forceps, so like really fancy tweezers, and then a needle stuck on the end of a stick, and a microscope. So the dissections I do are around larvae that are smaller than a grain of rice, so they're really, really tough. So you have to, you can't drink too much coffee before you start dissecting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 